Okay, good afternoon everyone. Uh, we're down in Southern Piedmont area doing tree identification today. And welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name's Jason Fisher. I'm the Extension Forester for Central District with Virginia Cooperative Extension. And thank you for joining us. Behind me, you can see we have a Southern Catawpa, Catawpa Big Noniotes in full bloom. Uh, a lot of pollinators work in that today. Uh, this species grows near water, typically, uh, but is used by fishermen because the caterpillars make excellent fishing bait. That's why I have this tree in my yard, which is where we are today on property here in Halifax County. Stick with me, we're going to take a walk. Okay, our second tree for today is going to be red maple, Acer rubrum. And if I walk in close and you look at the stem arrangement on this tree, you can see that the limbs grow opposite one another. So you have the main stem here, and the limbs come off opposite. But red maple is the most common tree that we do find in the southern Piedmont. It does grow in full shade. Um, you can see the leaf is pretty, pretty easy to determine. It has the three lobes. They're not very deep. You can see the edges are serrated. You can see the, the toothed edge. So when you're doing tree identification, Obviously, leaves are used a lot. Um, I'm going to try to look at some bark and other things today, too, because these are deciduous trees, and they shed their leaves. And it's not always the best indicator to use when you're doing tree identification. And I'm standing here, actually, uh, in the midst of a tree here that's very common in Southside. You might recognize it from the leaves that it is an oak, Quercus alba, white oak. Um, Probably one of the most valuable tree species we have as far as timber goes, but also from a wildlife perspective in that it produces acorns and, and mast. Which, and what I want you to notice from the leaves is it has uh, round tips. Uh, the sinuses here are not quite as deep as some red oaks. We're going to see one of those in a moment. Um, you can see they're rounded like the tips of your fingers. That's kind of a giveaway. Uh, the bark. Uh, on white oak is uh, almost a silver appearance. I'm going to pan here because we're up in the tree here and you can see the bark pretty close. It's pretty good sized platelets. They do change as they get older as all trees do. Bark looks very different with younger trees than they do when they're older. Kind of like people. Trees are a lot like people more than we want to admit. We can see um, a number of things on the leaves. In fact, I was just noticing with this tree we had some galls. So there are oak galls. You may find these little round uh, balls, if you will, or galls. They aren't acorns. This is just June, so it's too early for acorn. You can see on this limb here there's a, a gall. It's kind of brown colored. Insects, different types of wasp species. I'm not a perfectionist with entomology, but they use uh, trees as their homes. They'll inject eggs into the branches, and the tree's response is to compartmentalize that invasion of whatever it may be, and it'll form a gall, whether that's on the leaf or the, the stem. So, pretty neat. So, just kind of pan out here, and you'll see. In the limbs of this white oak, this is a fairly young tree, but you'll notice leaves that are in the sun sometimes will be have deeper sinuses or have a little different shape than leaves that are in the shade. Okay, so my advice to you is don't grab a leaf from the shade and assume that that is a representative sample. Always get one that's out in the sunlight, and we'll take a look at that real quick. And here's our leaves out in the sunlight. See the sinuses are a little deeper than the leaf I just showed you. And so we want to use this one as a good representative example. If you look close in the uh, tree here, you can see we got some acorns that have come about. They will be fully mature and ripe by the fall of the year and produce a lot of food for wildlife deer, turkeys, uh, waterfowl. 
All right, here's our next tree. We've just come across the yard from the white oak you see there in the background. The sun shining on it. Notice the bark on this tree is really deep groove. It's darker. Uh, this is an older tree. It's probably 30 plus inches in diameter. And uh, we'll get out here in the sun since we're going to stick to these sun leaves so we get a, a good shape. If you see that, it's pretty distinctive. Number one, I want you to notice the leaves are pointed. Put this leaf here. Get the sun to my back. You can maybe see that a little better. Kind of shiny, glossy, but pointed leaves, so you know it's a red oak. White oaks have rounded leaf tips. A little deeper sinus on this. And if you notice, the bottom of the leaf is kind of rounded. So that term, pretty as a southern bell, if you will. It's kind of where that uh, originated from. Quercus falcata. Southern red oak. So they drop acorns every other year, whereas white oaks produce every year. And one telltale to that is if you're gathering acorns in the fall, you'll notice after a good rain, white oaks will uh, put a foot out or root pretty soon, whereas red oaks continue to sit there. So white oaks will sprout or rot much sooner the acorn will so often often the food from our red oaks the acorns will be eaten later in the season by wildlife so mother nature has a neat way of providing a food source throughout the year and we'll take a look at the acorns that have been set they're very scaly brown a little different than our white oak we saw earlier And so this tree will be be putting out some food this fall in mass, another good wildlife tree. But again, southern red oak. You'll find them just about anywhere, a very common tree for the Piedmont. Tree number four today, sweet gum. Probably should be number one. Lots of sweet gum in southern Piedmont. Uh, Liquid Dunbar, Styrocifula. Uh, what I've always noticed with sweet gum that gives it away is the star-shaped leaf. You can see the five, um, five star leaf. Actually, has a little a hitch in the back that might look like seven, but that gives it away. The other thing is, if you look along the bark, see these ridges. That's typical of sweet gum. They'll have a a corky ridge-type structure that grows along the bark. Um, people will call me and say, what's wrong with my tree? What kind of diseases does it have? It helps to know what's normal. So that's normal for sweet gum. But again, star-shaped leaf uh, produces a fruit that is very annoying. Uh, it has real sticky, sharp edges. It's a ball. Um, I'll see one today. I'll pick it up and show you. But where we're standing, this is a young tree, and it's not producing any just yet. But here by the water, which is typically where they will grow, and just about anywhere else, sweet gum. Almost rubra. If you listen, feel that. The very characteristic of slippery elm has a sandpapery type leaf. It's not slippery at all. It's pretty gritty. It's about like 80 grit sandpaper. The reason we know it's an elm is this very characteristic, easy giveaway with the leaf. So if you notice the base of the leaf, one side is a little bit, maybe sticks down lower than the other. It's uneven, how about that, okay? If you can see that. And so we know it's in the elm family for that, that reason, almost. Now, there are other elms in, South, in the southern Piedmont, uh, rock elm, American elm. Many American elm have died of the Dutch elm disease. But we're talking about this one. It's serrated leaf margins, but the giveaway is the sandpapery leaf. It is a riparian species. Again, almost rubra. And uh, the Native Americans actually used this tree for medicinal purposes. Um, they would actually take the phloem from this tree and um, use it for a throat lozenge. So they would gargle, yeah, I guess for sore throats, kind of like maybe we would do for um, a salt water, as bad as that sounds. And so you can see here the bark, uh, pretty interlacing bark. 
Uh, very similar to hickory, but a lighter color. Well, we don't want to leave out a couple of evergreens common to the Piedmont. Pinus virginiana, Virginia pine. Uh, they have very short needles, and they're in fascicles. This is a fascicle if you break off one and, and look at it. These are in pairs, and usually they're twisted. So um, there's a good shot there. They've got a kind of a little twist to them, kind of a corkscrew, but they're in pairs. They're always being twos. And you see a number of pine cones, lots of pine cones. Those are uh, this year's. Uh, here's a, a fresh green one here that'll drop seed this fall. Birds like to eat those. Very common tree in the southern Piedmont. Uh, the bark will show a, a bigger tree here. And a shot of Virginia pine bark. There's that copper color. And they don't do a good job of shedding the lower limbs. If you look at that tree there, even though those limbs have no green needles and aren't producing any food for the tree, it holds on to them. So a lot of pitch. Back in the 60s, there was a big wave of knotty pine cabinets and cabinetry in homes. I lived in one of those homes. And so if you see those lower limbs still attached in the copper bark, you don't even need to see the needles. You can pretty much guarantee it's Pinus virginiana, uh, Virginia pine. And a shot from a distance of uh, Virginia pine. You can see the lower dead limbs there through those openings. A very classic in southern Piedmont where there were old farm fields, tobacco fields. Uh, many times you'll find rows in the understory. Virginia pine will overtake those spots and over time will fill in with uh, with hardwoods. All right, this is our second evergreen uh, tree to show you in the southern Piedmont that's native, Pinus echinata. This is shortleaf pine. And if you'll notice the needles are green down low. This is trees on the edge, so it has some lower limbs. Um, some people refer to it as black pine. Uh, that's just a common name it's given, but shortleaf pine. We'll take a look at the needles real quick. And here are your needles. Um, they are longer than Virginia pine, even though it's called shortleaf pine. You can see this year's growth there on the end, the, the brighter green. These are also in twos, but not twisted. You may find some in threes. It's about like finding a full leaf clover. It's not just something you'll grab and find. I'll put that as a challenge for you. Somebody send me a picture of a short leaf and the three needles you find. They're there, just gotta look. We'll pan up into the tree, very healthy tree. And you notice not as many pine cones. Virginia pine has lots of cones. Short leaf will be less and the cones are a little larger. Nonetheless, a good uh, tree for flooring. The wood's usually a little more dense, slow grown. We'll take a look at the bark. I'll have you look at the platelets. Large platelets on the bark kind of give away short leaf. But here's a real good indicator. These pitch tubes, little small holes. Some people may think borers are making them. If you look close, they don't go all the way through the, the platelets. Little small areas, pitch tubes. Very characteristic of the barks, like you and I having a, a mole on our skin. It's just indicative to the, to the species. Uh, but notice the larger platelets, not quite the copper color that our Virginia pine had. This is a sprout growing side by side. And there's a big one there in the background. And a shot of the cones. Have a big tree. Join us for next week's topic on 15 Minutes in the Forest about the Virginia Big Tree Program. My colleague Bill Worrell and Dr. Eric Wiseman from Virginia Tech will be sharing about that program. You don't want to miss that.